My background is long and varied in the screenwriting business. I was just talking to Jackie, and we know many people together, and, and I'm so glad that she's still involved in this, in the process of uh, screenwriting and, and filmmaking, because it's really great here in New Mexico these days for that kind of process. Um, We'll hold, if you will, you'll hold your questions till the end of my discussion because, again, I'm, I said to somebody kind of offhand, I'm, I'm ADD, and without these things, I could end up anywhere. Uh, so if you'll hold your questions, because that's a lot better for all of us uh, as we're going through this information. Um, I uh, started writing screenplays in 2002. Uh, I started writing in 2001 when I sold my company. Uh, we had a company here, a travel agency here in town, and I thought, okay, I want to start writing. I want to finish doing this. I did, and for the first year that I wrote, I wrote everything. And I joined this organization. And I've joined since at various times when I had the time to do that. And uh, so I started writing everything. I wrote poetry. I wrote. Uh, started a couple novels, a number of short stories. I wrote articles for a number of magazines here locally successfully. Um, I wrote a, a radio play that was produced by KUNM called The Miserable Kingdom. And I ended up on the front page of the Albuquerque Journal as a racist. That was awfully fun. Um, uh, so I wrote everything. And then I had a friend uh, say to me, well, why don't we go to California and attend the screenwriting uh, conference? And I had never considered screenwriting. Uh, I thought movies just happened. It, it just literally never crossed my mind. And I'll discuss that again in a minute. But I got kind of carried away. I went out to the conference and I came back and I, I felt like I really knew what I wanted to do with my writing time. I wanted to write screenplays. And rarely since that time have I regretted it. I love reading screenplays as works of, of literature. I love writing the screenplay format. I do it fairly well. I have won more awards probably than most screenwriters in this state and I still don't have anything on the screen, okay? So while I do enjoy and love the screenplay process and the screenplay writing process specifically, it, is, it can be very intimidating as a long-term project. But we're gonna, clog, we're gonna talk about that tonight because I believe that you as novelist sit in a better position than I do as a screenwriter. And we're gonna discuss it, and I'm gonna tell you why. So, I'm gonna read something to you. Let me get rid of my candy. Let's put that right there. I won't, I won't pick it up and use it again, okay? So, I'd like to discuss something that novelists, I would like to discuss the edge that novelists have, okay? And why I'm excited about this discussion today. And I'm going to read a passage. It's, it's about a page and a half. So I'd like you all, if you would, and if you're uncomfortable doing this, don't do it. Uh, I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you to just listen. I'd like you not to be involved in anything else if you can do that. And it'll take about a minute or two here. It was almost 3 o'clock, the hottest part of the day, when they saw a regiment of French soldiers walking alongside them, dragging their rifles. The soldiers moved in a disorganized way, not in formation, not smartly. A tank rumbled beside them, crunching over belongings left in the road. On it, several way-faced French soldiers sat slumped, their heads hung low. Isabel pulled free of Gatan and stumbled through the crowds, elbowing her way to the regiment. You're going the wrong way, she screamed, surprised to hear how Horse, her voice was. Gaetan pounced on the soldier, shoved him back so hard he stumbled and crashed into a slow moving tank. Who's fighting for France? The bleary eyed soldier shook his head. No one. In a glint of silver, Isabel saw the knife Gaetan held to the man's throat. The soldier's gaze narrowed. Go ahead. Do it. Kill me. Isabel pulled Gaetan away. In his eyes, she saw a rage so deep it scared her. He could do it. He could kill this man by slitting his throat. And then she thought, they opened the prisons. Was he worse than a thief? 
Get, she said. Her voice got through to him. He shook his head as if to clear it and lowered his knife. Who is fighting for us? He said bitterly, coughing at the dust. We will be, she said, soon. Behind her, an automobile honked its horn. Auga! Isabel ignored it. Automobiles were no better than walking anymore. The few that were still running were moving only at the whim of the people around, like flotsam in the reeds of a muddy river. Come on, she pulled him away from the demoralized regiment. They walked on, still holding hands, but the hours passed. Isabel noticed a change in Gaetan. He rarely spoke and didn't smile. At each town, the crowd thinned. People stumbled into Ardennes, Ceron, and Orleans. Their eyes alight with desperation as they reached into handbags and pockets and wallets for money they hoped to be able to spend. Still, Isabel and Gaetan kept going. They walked all day and fell into exhausted sleep in the dark and woke again to walk the next day. By the third day, Isabel was numb with exhaustion. Oozing red blisters had formed between most of her toes and on the balls of her feet, and every step was painful. Dehydration gave her a terrible pounding headache, and hunger gnawed at her empty stomach. Dust clogged her throat and eyes and made her cough constantly. She stumbled past a freshly dug grave on the side of the road, marked by a crudely hammered together wooden cross. Her shoe caught on something, a dead cat, and she staggered forward, almost falling to her knees. Gaetan steadied her. She, slung, she hung to his hand, remained stubbornly upright. How much later was it that she heard something? An hour? A day? Bees. They buzzed around her head. She batted them away. She licked her dry lips and thought of pleasant days in the garden with bees buzzing about. No, not bees. She knew that sound. She stopped, frowning. Her thoughts were addled. What had she been trying to remember? The droning grew louder, filling the air, and then the aeroplanes appeared. Six or seven of them looking like small crucifixes against the blue and cloudless sky. Isabel tented a hand over her eyes, watching the aeroplanes fly closer, lower. Someone yelled, it's the Boches! In the distance, a stone bridge exploded in a spray of fire and stone and smoke. Open your eyes. How many have read this? This is an incredible novel. It came out just last year, actually 2016. It was published. It's called Nightingale. The reason I picked this particular passage to read is because it's very evocative. It is about the two million people that walked out of Paris before the Germans arrived and all the roads they clogged, and it goes on to explain. But let me ask you something. How many of you, when I was reading, were playing that in your mind? How many of you were seeing that? Yeah, yeah. Um, next slide. That's called the mind's eye. I doubt very seriously if there's anybody in here with a condition called aphantasia. And aphantasia, is probably one out of 10 million people have a condition called aphantasia. They can't see. They have no mind's eye. But the rest of us do. And the mind's eye is the writer's advantage because what you're doing is you're making a movie in people's heads. There is a certain kind of leverage to that that a filmmaker doesn't have. But what a filmmaker does have and their launch pad is the fact that everybody envisions what has been written and wants to see that in film. I think one of the, you know, and there, there are, how, how, many have, how many people have read a novel that you think, I want to see that in film? And then it's like the worst piece of dung you've ever seen in your life, okay? I think there was a time when I was growing up as a kid that many movies were, many books were made into movies, and some of them were great. But I think 
one of the best jobs ever. And then there was a time during the during the 60s, 70s, and 80s where they were trying to make movies and it just wasn't working. They made a lot of really bad movies out of really great books. I think what changed is when Peter Jackson created the trilogy, when he took that marvelous set of books by Tolkien and he said, aha, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do them all at the same time and I'm gonna do, it's gonna be three. It's each book deserves a movie. And there was some pushback on that when he decided to do that, but it didn't last long. And he got the money he needed to make that. Um, but by the same token, they still take good books and they make bad movies. Has anybody seen the Divergent series or read the Divergent series? Okay. The, it doesn't work. <laughs> and it doesn't work because in their infinite wisdom, some filmmaker decided Primarily, it doesn't work because that infinite wisdom, they, they decided to make the main character 24 years old instead of the 18 that he's supposed to be. So what happened is many people see a 24-year-old hitting on a 16-year-old girl and it kind of goes, you know, and it doesn't work. And then from there, everything just kind of fell apart, okay? So we've all seen those great pieces of literature become trash in a filmmaker's hands, okay? Um, I had a, I had a kind of a, and, and I think we, most of us have probably done this if we're writers and novelists, we have seen a movie and then gone to read the book. How many have done that? Okay, and it can be a very good experience. Um, the Help was the latest one a couple of years ago. I saw the film and then I said, I'm gonna read that book. And I was pleasantly pleased with both of them. I thought the acting in the movie was great. I thought the book was great. Um, but the first time that happened to me was, next slide, how many of you remember this film? The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. Raise your hands. Anybody? 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 Anybody want to take a guess on who wrote that? Okay, that was the first film ever produced for a Dr. Seuss piece. They asked him to write the screenplay for The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T about a young boy who falls asleep during a really bad session of piano lessons, ick. And he dreams that he's been taken off by Dr. T with hundreds of other boys to play this giant piano day and night, okay? That's his dream, that's the whole story. So it's as weird a Dr. Seuss thing as you can find. He wrote 1,200 page script for this, okay? Of course, <laughs> that doesn't work at all. And they ended up with this. And it, it truly is not all that great, but to me as a little kid sitting in Anchorage, Alaska, when there was nothing else to do because there was snow up to here and it was dark outside, this was incredible. So I went looking for the book because I'd read The Cat in the Hat and I knew he wrote books. And I could never find it. And of course, in those days, what did we have? We had card catalogs. We didn't have computers. It wasn't that easy. You had to go to the library at the school, and then you had to go to the Anchorage Daily, Anchorage Library. You couldn't find anything, okay? So no Dr. T. I could never read that book, but I saw the screenplay, and that was total failure. But my dad read us lots when we were kids. So all of the great classics that he read us, including things like Moby Dick and, and Kim and Jungle Book, all of those things eventually became movies, and they kind of tweaked my interest in books being made into film. Because I still didn't understand that somebody sat down and wrote screenplays. I didn't get that. I don't know how they took the book and made a movie, and I didn't really care. It was just that it's a book, I've read it, I've heard about it, my dad read it, and it's become a movie. So in the 1980s, I started collecting books. Okay, I now have 800 books sitting around my house, clogging up space in my TV room and my closet and everything else. The first one I bought was this. It's Moby Dick. And for many of you who don't understand, Moby Dick was not the great American classic that it is today until this book was published. This book is illustrated by Rockwell Kent. And part of the popularity of this book was those illustrations and it sent this book to the top of the charts when this book was published. And that was in, I believe, the 1930s. Well, by 1950-something, John Huston had decided to turn this into a movie. And he got uh, Gregory Peck to play the main part. 
and there were terrible fights between those two, and a friend, their friendship dissolved. And does anybody want anybody have a wild guess as to who wrote the screenplay? Ray Bradbury wrote the screenplay for Moby Dick. And there were terrible fights between him and John Huston. Apparently John Huston pissed everybody off. Um, so this was the first book. One of the other early books that I bought when I started collecting books made into films was this book written by our very own governor, yes. Ben Hur. Yeah, I love the movie. I love the movie. So in the 80s, when I saw this sitting on a shelf, I said, got to have that. Okay, I haven't read this. One of these days, I'll, I'll thumb through it. Preparing to do this program, I read Slaughterhouse-Five again, and I watched the movie. It's a marvelous book, and it's a marvelous movie, but they're two distinct, different products. If you want to do a comparison, I would challenge you to read this book again if you haven't read it, or read it for the first time. It's a marvelous story. And then watch the movie. And we'll talk more about why the movie works even though it's so different than the book. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so, when I started collecting books, and then I went into screenwriting, I didn't realize I was making a tad bit of a mistake, okay? Because I started writing everything, then I got carried away by screenwriting. And my wife can tell you, I, I spent days, weeks, wor I worked hard doing this. But a bit of a mistake, and I'll explain that a bit later, but let's go to the next slide. In the vast pantheon, of books to movies. I've just put here a few. The classics, almost everything except maybe leaves of, leaves of grass, you know, things like that have not, I, I don't think um, Kerouac has been turned into a movie, okay, except maybe a movie about his life. But those are the kind of things that don't translate to movies or even based on movies. But everything else, I mean, look up there, everything else. Catch-22 is one of the first novels I ever read. Uh, Brothers Karmazov, The Odyssey. The Odyssey is one of the oldest stories known to man. I mean, I think there's one or two older things. Maybe the Bible, the Talmud, uh, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, those are maybe older. In fact, Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest thing ever written. Uh, but everything, everything. There's literally hundreds of things written. Um, and so another thing I did is I, as I went on to Wikipedia, I said, okay, I want to see how many books have been turned into, into, into movies or productions. And amazingly, um, as I was looking through this wealth of information, um, I learned that things like The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, that's in the A's. <laughs> okay, Wikipedia has it alphabetically listed. So in the A's, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, since 1908 to 2008, has been produced 17 different times. So many of these books, many of these older classics, have been produced and reproduced and reproduced and reproduced for every succeeding generation in a different manner by a different filmmaker. The Adventures of Pinocchio by Calvo Collati, 1883, 22 productions of that story, okay? So novelists have written things that last, that each generation says, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that, I wanna present that. Does anybody remember AI, 2001, Artificial Intelligence, the movie? Pinocchio, it's a Pinocchio story, that's what it is, okay? So there is a wealth of storytelling in all of these manuscripts that have come down to us for generations, hundreds and thousands of years. I don't know how many times the Odyssey has been redone, but it's got to be numerous. Um, next slide. Current literature. Okay, these are, I, I looked at everything from the 1900 on, which is I consider current modern literature, we all do. Everything. Look at this. Agatha Christie, everything, everything. 
uh, Lost City of Z, which is was a horrible movie, but maybe a good book. I haven't read it yet. Uh, and I'll explain why that is a horrible movie uh, a little later. But the, the overwhelming number of books that are turned into movies is staggering when you begin to look at it. Um, it's a, it, novels and even short stories, Philip Dick has written short stories that they have made into movies. Short stories. And any number of short story writers have had their products turned into films. This is very fertile ground for the, for the entertainment industry. Uh, and is this something to get excited about? Yes, it is. Anybody remember Eraserhead? I love that photograph. I use it every time I do a production like this. I just throw it in there because it's awesome. And I don't think Eraserhead was a, was a book. Um, it's, it is exciting because when I went to Wikipedia and looked at the number of books turned into films, in just the A category, there were 273 books turned into films, and those 273 represent about 780 films, because Pinocchio is produced 22 times, Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Adventures of Huck Film, they're all produced over and over and over again. And as we know, as writers and novelists, each generation wants to be told a love story, a bedtime story, an adventure story, and we all go back to the same things. We all pull up what we've all known from before, and we rewrite it and redo it for new generations and new people that want new stories. But we're all telling the same stories over and over again, and the entertainment the business is no different. And slide six. I don't know if you can read these because of the light, but... Um, if you'll just flip through those pretty quick, you can see any number of these are current novels that you have read and then gone to see the movies. There's literally and literally hundreds of these. To Kill a Mockingbird, Train, train Spotting, Sun City. Sophie, Sun City was actually a graphic novel. And I talk, was talking to somebody earlier who said, you, Jackie, about graphic novelist who had his, novel turn, his graphic novel turned into a movie, right? Okay, graphic novels being turned into movies. And next slide. This is the most, these are the most uh, uh, adapted authors today. And of course you see Stephen King there with the big head, right? The giant head. Stephen King has had 34 novels turned into movies. Nicholas Sparks, which surprised me, because I'm not a big Nicholas Sparks fan, but 11 of his works have been turned into movies. I know, I know, I just, I just can't get into it. Um, John Le Carre, uh, Ian McEwen, 10 each. John Grisham, J.K. Rowling, 9 each. Clive Barker, Dean Koontz, and Philip Roth, 8 each. Nick Hornby, William Goldman, 7. Larry McMurtry, Thomas Harris, and Stephanie Meyer, 6 each. And of course, if, if J.K. Rowling, if, if this was about how much money they had, her, her head would be four times as big as Stephen King's. Okay. Actually, it'd be two times. She's a, got a billion. He's only got 400 million. So where does this leave us? Okay. Hollywood wants you. And when I say Hollywood, I'm talking about in the vast, large term of entertainment. I'm not talking about Hollywood, California. Okay. Um, I'm talking about the entertainment business is constantly searching for content. Constantly. And it's growing. Next slide. Thank you, Kim. The growth in the number of content producers on television, currently, at your home, if you have Netflix, <coughs> Netflix will produce 80 films this year. This year, Hulu, who, who never heard of Hulu before five years ago? I remember somebody telling me, oh yeah, it's this TV thing called Hulu. Hulu, what a stupid name. Well, they produce 31, they produce 31, or will produce 31 productions over the next two years. And they just finished with uh, um, Handmaiden's Tale, which is a fabulous book. And I think they've done a credible job 
The first time they ever produced that was with, uh, I can't remember her name. It was horrible. It was a, they did it in movie form, it was horrible. But Hulu has taken it and done an incredible job of Handmaiden's Tale, and it kind of goes with what's going on today. It's starkly amazing. Amazon is currently producing 19 new productions. HBO is producing 45 productions, uh, and has a string of huge productions over the years. And we've started, HBO kind of started the we will produce our own stuff kind of thing years ago. Um, and let's talk about countries. India is the largest movie producer in the world, 876 productions a year. Hollywood produces 300. They pale in comparison to India. China is the waking giant in another sense because they are going to outproduce everybody in a few years. Now you think, well, what does it have to do with me? They constant. I constantly on my inner on my on my email that is for specifically for writing process. I'm constantly seeing invitations for American writers, English writers, for content to China and India. They are content hun hungry. We write things differently than them that their people want to see. Sometimes they, in China it's hard to get the content there, but they're still looking for it. And they're still developing, they're building one of the biggest movie sets in the world in China right now. Um, so these are huge markets with their own writers, but they are still looking for worldwide content. Oh, excuse me, class is out. <laughs> um, slide 13, next slide. And, how many people have the new Roku where you talk into the thing and say, yeah. Have you looked at all the channels they have? It's amazing. Roku has 1,800 channels. 1,800 content, places of content, okay? Um, let's see. And... Amazon has 4,000, and then you have Samsung Smart TV, Apple TV, and a number of other content carriers that are developing. It costs $10,000 to set up your own channel on Roku. That's about what it costs. 10000 or less, you can set up your own channel. It could be like Mark's hobby channel, okay? And it's just me sitting there writing 24 hours a day, okay? And that's all it is, and I just, different times. And people get on it. People pay people to advertise on their channel. You can buy old movies and put them on. A number of the people do that. You can, you can start a channel just for shorts. So there's, they're developing content, and they're content hungry. They're looking for what you're doing, OK? Um, slide 14. And part of the thing that's really getting great is that independent filmmakers, now Hollywood films, uh, I think, what was it? It was Terminator 2 was the first movie that cost $100 million. And Hollywood went, ah, okay? But now they spend $100 million, $200 million, $250 million, like it's throwing it in the toilet, you know? And all these, all these summer tentpole movies that you're seeing, 80 to 100, 200 million dollars is what they're spending. And, now we have independent filmmakers, and I was just talking to Jackie about this again. You can go down to Best Buy, you can buy a camera, light, an editing system out of your, with your credit card. You can start your own film company. You can start your own production company right here. We have actors looking for jobs. We have people willing to write. Anybody who wants to do a movie can do it. It's not hard to do anymore. So a lot of independents are starting. Now, this, independents were big during the 70s, and then they kind of disappeared. They're coming back because the cost of this is going down, but they are looking for content. They are looking for good stories. Um, so, next slide. Where does this leave you? You're a novelist. You're not a screenwriter. I would encourage you to stay a novelist, unless you like not making any money doing what you do, okay? If you like that, write screenplays. Um, Hollywood gets, Hollywood makes 300 movies a year. They receive about 300,000 screenplays a year. So it's daunting. Getting involved with them is daunting, okay? 
And again, I talk about the general industry uh, less than I talk about Hollywood because most people are directed to Hollywood when you should be looking at the... But again, as a, as a screenwriter, what I don't want to do, I don't want to take time away from writing, which is our valuable time as writers. That's where we shine. I don't want to go produce a movie. I don't want to go... I have cameras. I have lights. I have a summer film program for kids. I have all the equipment I need, need to make my own film. But I want to write. I don't want to do that. I want some young person to do that. Okay? Uh, I just pass my bedtime now. These people making movies have to stay up 24 hours a day. I would shoot myself in the head. Or ask my wife to bring a gun and do it. Um, unlike that, when you write a novel, there are, and I got this, off, I can't remember what site, but it's a site that knows. There are somewhere that between 600,000 and a million books published in the United States every year. Okay? About half of those are self-published, which means you can still publish your own thing. The difference between what I do and what you do, when you do what you do, you have a finished thing. You can self-publish your own poetry. You can go online and publish it. I have to go do something else that I don't want to do. Okay? So, novelist, short story fiction writers, people that write that kind of material are in, in a good place today. You're in a good place. Keep writing what you're writing. Write great stories. Write great short stories. A novel is a finished product. And if it's a novel that gains traction, it has a far better chance at success, at somebody looking at it. This young lady, the lady who wrote this, has a number of novels. And they were all kind of, kind of beach reads, huh? They're kind of beach reads. This is different. And I can guarantee you the moment her publisher read this, she got on the phone to somebody that had fingers into movie making. The moment she read it. And this will be out in movie 2019, next year. It was published in 2016, okay? But I can guarantee her publisher said, this is a film. You have done something remarkable. This is a film. This is a great book for men and women. It's a woman's story. And that's another reason that's gonna be hot. But for men or women, it's a great tale of World War II, one of the best I've ever read. So she gained traction by writing what she loved to write. Okay, so where does this leave you? You have four challenges as writers, as novelists. And I'm going to be giving a workshop on this, I believe February 3rd, is it the 3rd? I think so. Something, something like that, it's on the next slide. Uh, but I'm gonna point out four things that you can look at right now, because novelists can make huge mistakes. I have, over the years that I've been doing this, I've worked with several people on novels. I even had one guy who paid me some money and we got down the road, and he, it, w it was also during 2008, and he had huge money problems. And I don't, do, I don't do that for no money. He wanted his novel turned into a screenplay, and he was paying me to do it. We got down the road, and he was a little daunted by the fact that I was changing his novel to fit what a screenplay needs to be. And he had money problems, so we dropped the project. And... Uh, I had a young lady come to me years ago who wanted me to turn her brother's baseball story into a screenplay. And yet it wasn't a screenplay, it wasn't, it wasn't a story, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So it, I'm, I'm gonna give you four things that you can start looking at in your, in your short stories and your novels if you, because what this is to you is another source of income. Whether it's a local production, whether you have somebody who wants to option your work, Options go for about $1,000, okay, or more. Somebody options your work, it could be $1,000 or more in your pocket just to option your work. Okay, if they buy your book, that's many thousands of dollars more. And then you have all those people watching your production that are then going to think about buying your book or your books, okay? So this is very exciting, but the first four challenges are length. Again. Uh, a screenplay is 110 to 120 pages. Past that, people get tired and don't want to see the movie. I think a lot of people hung around for a Titanic, but it, you know there are very few of those 
kind of over two two hour movies that people <laughs> like. The screenplay is 110 pages. And the adaptation of a novel requires the screenwriter to cut everything. They look just for the essence and the spirit of the story. And that's what made this successful. The screenwriter captured the essence and the spirit of this story because it's so different. The movie is so different than the novel. But he captured the spirit of what goes on here. It's a total anti-war story. And the movie was anti-war. And it was very clear. The novel, the screenwriter will have to determine the through line and major subplots and then viciously cut everything else that you've put into your baby. Cut off its arms and its head and its legs and just so that the heart is there and that's it. And many people don't like that. There are lots of stories of those. You've probably heard many of them. Uh, the man I worked with, he wasn't excited about the fact that I was told him it wasn't working. We had to, we had to cut and we had to change things. And uh, do, do you all know what a through line is? Okay, a through line is what carries your story. Same thing in a screenplay, okay? Uh, Dorothy goes to see the wizard so that she can find a way to beat the witch, wicked witch of the West and get, her, get herself home. That's a through line. Dorothy, from, go from here to going home, that's the through line. And the subplots are all the extra characters. And same thing with your novel. You will have subplots that you love, that you like. You will have characters that you love, that you like. I would ask you if you're working on something and you want to look towards filmmaking, towards extra income, or you think this would be a good movie, that you watch those things because they will either cut them or they'll reject the book right out of hand. Because they know you'll fight them or they'll just say, it doesn't work. Even as a book, it doesn't work to us as a movie. Okay? Voice. Lots of writers write in first person. It doesn't work as a film. It never works as a film. First person. Voiceovers do not work. They hate voiceovers. Uh, voiceovers, what voiceovers do for a film is slow it down. It takes you out of the movie. Unless they're used very carefully and only at specific moments to give only specific, specific information that the audience can't find. Okay, uh, and, and voiceover again is 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 talking. People go to the movie because they want to see a motion picture. Okay, and the old adage "show don't tell" is never more critical than in filmmaking. The next thing is long thinking, and long thinking. I'm going to read you something, and you'll get it right away. Mike knew in his heart that Judith was no good. Yet she caused such a stirring in his loins, he could think of nothing else. He feared someday he would give in to his temptation named Judith, and his surrender would surely bring about the end of his marriage. How does a filmmaker film that? Okay? When you're writing as a novelist and you write that kind of passage and you're writing a thing that you're saying, okay, I'd like this to tr be transferable to film and I think it's a good story and it could work because I watch all the movies and I know what they're looking for. I know they're looking for love stories. I mean, oh my God, we, we must have watched 15 just recently filmed Christmas stories on Roku this morning. It's just Bob and the Christmas story and Christmas love and tantamount to Christmas love, and you know, there were just a dozen of them. These are all new screenplays, and they're all new films developed for a populace that's hungry for Christmas stories. So they filmed these schmaltzy love stories, and I, I like some of them, I, but they're still schmaltzy love stories, but they, some of them probably came from novels. Okay? So what you're writing is transferable, but you have to watch these four things and more. And finally, where's the beef? <laughs> About Oakland, California, I think it was Gertrude Stein who said, got there and looked around and said, there's no there there. <laughs> you know? And it's the same with many stories. I have read a lot of stories that at the end of the story, I'm going, there's no there there. 
There's, there's nothing. I mean, it's a, it's a series of episodic situations, but there's not really a story because the person hasn't understood that a through line needs to be there. That, it, that you have to have a strong central character and a, and a protagonist and an antagonist. And there has to be a goal for that central character, that protagonist that has got to have a goal just dead on right there. And it can change at any point, but eventually there has to be something. Um, I don't know, I, I'm interested in reading The Lost City of Z because they took a story that I was highly interested in, I love adventure stories, and by the end of it, I just wanted to jump off my roof on my head. I just, I just wanted to beat my head against the wall. It's like, wh why? I watched this for two hours and it, 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 you know, and if you take a, if you want to see something that doesn't work, watch The Lost City of Z. It does not work, and at the end of it, you will be going, why? And I want to see if that's what happened in the book. Because it is a story about a man who actually did these things, and they were incredible things, but they're just things. There was no central driving point, and they tried to develop that in the movie, but it didn't work well. So many stories, again, look at your own story and say, where's the beef? Where is the core of the story that's going to reach out and grab somebody by the heart and bring them in? Okay? And that's what, as novelists and even short story writers, you have to do. In some sense, I think writing short stories, it's easier sometimes to do that. Um, I will give you a warning. And this is me here talking, and I've gone down this road too. If you're going to pay somebody to write a screenplay, if you came to me with your novel and said, I would like you to turn this into a screenplay, I would charge you about $5,000. And then I'd give you that screenplay and say, good luck. Okay? It's the same problem I have when I write a screenplay, and I'm a multi-award winning screenwriter, and yet getting somebody to look at my work is daunting, well beyond the publishing business. I can tell you right now, and the reason is it takes $100,000 to publish a good book. It takes millions of dollars to make a movie. Millions. Even an independent movie will cost a million dollars to five million dollars for a small production. And that's why it's daunting to get your work as a screenwriter. So don't ever just go to somebody and say, I'd like you to write a screenplay out of my book. Because they're going to charge you money, they're going to cut your book to pieces, and you're either going to be happy with it or you're not, and then you're still going to have to take that screenplay and do something with it. So, we have a workshop, last slide, uh, Celluloid Aspirations, and the reason I put Celluloid Aspirations as a title for this, because I truly believe that as novelists and short story writers, this, you should take this up as an aspiration. You should consider that the things that you're working on have the possibility of being a film. If you write something good, you have the ability to get it in somebody's hands that will read it and look at it and say, yeah, that's a good story. We want to make that into a film. Um, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Are there questions?